Welcome back to the Schwab Network. I'm Oliver Rennick. We've got 13 minutes until the opening bell. Jeff Kleintop joins us, Chief Global Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Jeff, good morning, sir. Great timing with some Chinese data to have you here. Yeah, the, the China situation is an interesting one. There's a lot of nuance going on. So I, I think China is probably going to continue its drip feed of stimulus this week rather than make a big splash. But I think there could be some surprises in store, Oliver, in the September releases of the August data that may show some improvement here in what we're seeing. I've been pointing to the unseasonable rise in China's air pollution as a sign of renewed manufacturing activity. That seems to be correct. Last Friday, I'll get to today's data in a minute, but last Friday's manufacturing China PMI for August surprised on the upside with the move back into growth territory. I think it went from 49.2 to 51, along with the leading component of that, the new orders component, suggesting more improvement to come. So we could see more support prices on the upside there. Now, the service PMI this morning did weaken, but it remains in expansion territory, 51.8. What I noticed was that the PMIs of service industries like air transportation, accommodation, uh, catering, culture, sports and entertainment were all above 55. And that suggests to me that activity in other services industries like property may have deteriorated further in August, resulting in a lower overall services PMI number. So what it suggests is housing is still very weak, but the consumer or outside of that, whether it's culture and entertainment or travel, or in terms of spending on, on uh, uh, products and manufacturing activity, that seems to be improving. And, and I'm encouraged a little bit in seeing this rebalancing of growth within China. So, Jeff, uh, this is why you're so focused on the real estate side of it, right? Because it seems like yeah. that is really a, a heavy weight in the numbers that otherwise could be a little bit more impressive. Yeah, 100%. This is where the core of the weakness is in this property market. Now, we did see uh, Country Garden was able to meet a couple of payments on its dollar bonds. That's good to see. No technical default there yet. And it looks like there's a chance they could thread through. Obviously, the bond market is not expecting that high yield bonds uh, for Country Garden still trading at roughly 10 cents on the dollar. But I think the spillover effect of that is increasingly somewhat limited. Again, we're seeing a lot of leisure time spending activity by consumers, increasing purchases of goods. Goods. So if we can keep that contained, I know that seems like we've talked about that uh, back in 08, 09. Can we keep housing contained? No, we couldn't. But it looks like in, in uh, China, that may be a little different given that the banks, uh, the large banks are largely government owned, insulated from a lot of this stress. And we're seeing the country garden is not defaulting on their bonds, at least here in the near term, suggests maybe that weakness in housing might remain for some time, but overall growth might be a little bit better than expected as we get the data reported here in September for the month of August. Okay. So uh, go back to the chart we had up just a moment ago to kind of look at the trajectory here. There's also a little bit of a, an upswing back above 50 the last month and a half. I mean, that, that's something, seems like. Is, it's something, right? I mean, we'd like to see uh, a little bit more momentum in China's economy. What's interesting is, historically, if you look at a manufacturing PMI of 51, you think, well, that's barely above 50, barely in positive territory. But that's consistent with 7 or 8% industrial production growth within China, historically speaking. Uh, maybe those relationships have changed over the last several years versus maybe 10 years ago. But I still think that points to maybe a stronger manufacturing backdrop than will be indicated by that same number in the U.S. Okay. So uh, at least we're in the 50 territory. Can we attribute any of this to any of the recent measures China's taken policy-wise? Or I would guess that probably has some more time to work its way through the system before it shows up. There's likely more time needed, but what's interesting in, in that uh, in that chart of, uh, of air pollution is that it began to tick up a week or so after the Politburo meeting in July began to unveil new stimulus measures. So almost within a week of some of those measures being put in place, we started to see air pollution manufacturing activity begin to rise unseasonably for this time of year. Usually it's still declining till we get into the fall, but it, it began to tick back up again. I always find this as an interesting real-time measure of that activity seems to have paid off. So maybe some of those measures are beginning to show up in terms of increased activity within China. Uh, we'll have to see this here. You can see the chart there. So that blue line is this year, the average 2000 
2016 through 2022 is the gray line down below. I just show you the sharp rebound earlier this year and that reopening momentum, the incredible slide in Q2 as the economy ground to a halt, and then this tepid rebound here through the month of August, uh, and it, which is now showing up in official data. So I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing, but, but no reason to believe China's completely out of the woods here. I'd expect continued volatility in Chinese equities and those stocks tied to Chinese consumer demand. You just talked about Tesla, but there's many European companies also really tied into uh, the Chinese end consumer. Okay, speaking of stimulus kicking in, my coffee hasn't hit yet. I thought we were looking at the services, but you're looking at pollution there. Uh, okay, so uh, and I, the idea, though, is it might track some of the activity. And uh, I guess when it comes to China, pollution is good of an indicator as anything. Obviously, the big COVID drop-off. So that's uh, interesting, Jeff. I know you like to look at some of the uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, data points, the cardboard boxes, the pollution, the stuff that's not going to show up in the actual numbers that might give us a tell here. What do you think about the other story this morning uh, where they're going to try and raise some money to have a big chip fund and compete more directly with the U.S.? Like I was saying to Kevin, I mean, a lot of folks uh, will like to kind of uh, beat the battle war drums about Taiwan as an alternative for them to take over the chip industry. So, I mean, is this a better alternative than that? Well, uh, Taiwan is is everyone's go-to in the near term, uh, producing that you know incredibly you know two nanometer technology, the best chips in the world, the most uh, high power logic chips coming out of a Taiwan semiconductor. But everyone around the world is trying to say, well, what would happen if that was disrupted in some way? And so they're trying to you know bring their own industry up to those standards. That's probably uh, measured in years, maybe even a decade, rather than in months. But it is interesting to note that you know breakdown of a Huawei phone did show. Uh, some pretty advanced seven nanometer technology and they're about two generations behind the latest chips but still China may be making very rapid domestic improvement along those lines uh, really pulling all the stops out to try and uh, make sure they don't uh, they don't have to uh, engage in any other uh, uh, let's say a uh, conflict uh, in order to ensure their their supply of those chips so interesting to see that bear out I mean I think w this is something we're going to see duplicated around the world as many countries are racing to catch up to what uh, TSMC has done Gotcha. This morning, we've actually got crude oil up. Uh, we've got the dollar higher, and uh, we've got bonds selling off, too. It's not exactly the type of response you'd expect if there were some big rollover led by China happening in the global economy. What do you see in terms of their potential impact on commodities, Jeff? I know that you watch Nat Gas relative to Europe a lot. Traders think about crude oil relative to China a lot. How do you kind of navigate the overall uh, worldwide demand for energy right now? Well, it, the demand has started to uh, to improve relative to supply, right? Supply has really been pulled back. And, and there's an interesting question of what Russia and Saudi are going to be doing this fall. But it does look like a much tighter oil market. Uh, LNG, uh, liquid liquidified natural gas, is at risk due to a strike uh, this week uh, uh, of some uh, uh, Australian exports there uh, at risk. So there's a possibility here of a much uh, higher energy price uh, deck for, for lots of different energy commodities as we move through the winter. However, supplies are not um, uh, there's there's less risk of a supply shock than maybe we've had in the last couple of last few years, and that's probably good news. I've just got this chart here, just showing as we head into winter, what does this mean for Europe? They're basically their their storage is full. That blue line there, you can see the empty portion. Of that blue line is what they could still get, uh, what they could still fill all the way to capacity. But the percentage at the end is how close to full capacity they are, uh, even at this point going into winter. Most of them well over ninety percent. That's encouraging, maybe. A, a bit of relief here when it comes to Europe's economic and energy price outlook this winter, though they may be paying higher prices. Okay. So at this point, uh, the potential here for some flare ups is still there as far as uh, the production lines go for natty gas, uh, maybe crude to some extent as well. But um, for the most part, as of now, that is just a, a possibility for the, uh, the time being, things functioning fairly normally. I mean, when would we expect to see some of the effects of these show up in price? 
Uh, well, I, I think I, I probably we're already starting to see some of that. I, and I think we're probably going to continue to see that into the winter. I, I, it's very hard for me to judge exactly how much. I think the momentum is probably to the upside, just given the supply demand imbalance. But that may not be I, I, in general what we're seeing in terms of the the, the concerns about growth and, and the shock. Uh, you know, really has to do with when we're in much lower levels of uh, of inventories, and we're just not there, at least with regard to Europe. So I think the impact potentially of higher prices may not be as dramatic here as we take a look at the economic impact, because there's just not that risk of the supply getting cut off. So, you know, I, I think there's forecasts of around $93 for WTI as we look into this winter. I wouldn't quibble with that. That seems like a reasonable number. But if we can keep those numbers below 100, I think that's a bit of a relief to consumers and businesses as we head through the winter months just given the rather tight supply situation okay yeah the nat gas chart is like the slowest creep higher in the world i guess it uh, is uh, trending higher technically but um, you really have to squint to see it but it's there i mean it is uh, trending upward here off the lows uh, jeff uh, before i let you go to kind of uh, bring it full circle and always back home here as we like to do thinking about post pow last month and the rate dynamic hikes here versus or lack of hikes here maybe versus uh, more pressure for hikes in Europe, and then, of course, the opposite in China. Does that calculus uh, run out to positive dollar right now in your mind, or what's the impact, you think? You know, what's interesting is if you look at central bank policy rates, there are many of them around 4 5% wherever you look across Europe, the Nordic countries, uh, the U.S., obviously, Canada, uh, the U.K. So it may seem like they're all about the same, but real rates differ widely in how restrictive they are based on inflation forecasts. So if we adjust the policy rate for, for forward inflation expectations to see how restrictive it is, we can see that despite the most aggressive tight tightening cycles in decades, only the U.S. and Canada could be could, could you say monetary policy is said to be materially tight? Uh, it could be said the policy in most other major countries is close to neutral. And that means there's risk on the upside for both, I guess, I guess growth expectations, but more importantly, additional tightening outside the US. So I'd say maybe there's more of a risk to higher rates and maybe uh, higher currencies outside than inside the US. But in the near term, yeah, there's been this, uh, this lingering strength in the dollar here uh, until we actually see that action take place. So obviously, September is an important month. Will they or won't they at the ECB would be an important question and, and probably uh, help determine the trajectory there of the dollar. You know, the uh, UK number there, if we pull, pull that up again real sec, we'll take you into the opening bell here, Jeff. Puts in perspective just how tough their situation is, right? I mean, you got a five and a quarter policy rate, but still a negative real rate. It's like, that's uh, a standout to me in that chart. Yeah, it's rough and, and certainly suggests the Bank of England has a lot more work ahead of it. Yeah, wow. Uh, U.S. Uh, obviously still, I guess, technically the most hawkish on the block with the real rate at 290 bips. And uh, EU, I suppose, maybe has a little catch up to do there. Yeah, I think so. We'll see, right? I mean, it, it, inflation is coming down more rapidly in Europe than it is in the U.S. at this point. So that may help balance that out a little bit. But there's also at least a 50-50 shot of a rate hike by the ECB here in September. So we'll have to see how that goes. Okay. Good stuff, uh, Jeff. Uh, really a nice perspective for us. Uh, a lot of good global Thanks. topics this morning and uh, bringing it back to rates in the meantime. Amazing, uh, even with all the talk about no more hikes from the Fed and the policy rate being the highest already in the world on a real basis. Bonds selling off uh, and the dollar continues to uh, chug higher here as the opening bell brings us a little bit of weakness in equities, but not much. We're talking basis points right now.